different picture emerged, and that's when I started sort of expanding my understanding and, and questioning a lot of things about um, Tangle. And so I'm here to share a few of these things, especially about what happened at the, at the beginning. And of course, we're going to play a lot of this stuff. But um, the story starts with a rhythm, a rhythm that arrives in America um, with the Spaniards, uh, mostly. Sorry. And that it's a rhythm that, that has an Arabic and Northern African um, origin. And it's basically this rhythm. Now, we've all heard it. And you'll be surprised, I was in the grocery store this morning and a derivative of this rhythm was playing on the radio. It was not nobody else but um, Justin Bieber. Okay, so it's, it's a rhythm that has really followed us. And the rhythm has, among its many names, the name of tango, the tango rhythm or tangana rhythm. And we find this rhythm and when we're looking in the in the 19th century or earlier, we find it in the Caribbean. We find it in the south of the United States, in the Port of New Orleans. We find it in the Port of Havana. And it makes it all the way down to Rio and to Buenos Aires, right? And we want to illustrate this a little bit and play something that you may know, just to give you a sense of how this rhythm fits in the tradition of jazz, because there's a lot of parallels between tango and jazz, and there's a lot of things that have very little relationship. But at the, at the end of the 19th century, we hear this rhythm, which eventually makes it into W.C. Handy's St. Louis Blues. So hear this. Cuban music, and we could do the same thing with Cuban music, play you some Cuban music, with Brazilian music, and, and that rhythm was there. When it arrives in Argentina, it has, because of the particular mixture that we have down there, um, with uh, a lot less um, uh, of, the, of the slavery um, that, that you see in Brazil and further north, uh, because you know mostly the Spaniards um, uh, conquered the, the uh, uh, indigenous population and so the, the labor and everything that they did um, was was with with the indigenous population so we have a very interesting influx of, of afro uh, American culture afro Argentine culture um, because it's it's melded into our society quite um, uh, differently than in cultures where there was a lot more slavery so you you find in the ranks of musicians and craftspeople a lot of Afro-Argentines, and there was a significant Afro-Argentine population in the 19th century. Uh, but like I said, it's a very special group of people because um, uh, besides you know some of the uh, labor and uh, soldiers and and different things that that um, they were called to do, um, many of them found um, a space in the crafts, like I said, and in the in particularly music. So there were a lot of piano professors who were Afro-Argentine. And there were composers who were Afro-Argentine. And so one of the first tangos that we hear is by an Afro-Argentine. Um, and his name was um, Rosendo Mendizabal. And this is from 1897. So we're going to play a little bit of this tango just to give you a sense. This was a very peculiar tango that we play to this day. In fact, it opens the CD that we, uh, we just uh, announced. So it's, it, you know, a lot of these, these pieces of music keep coming back to us. Um, so, we start with the same rhythm, perhaps a little more of a march, a little more of a marshal.
Okay, so here's one of the first myths that, that uh, this, this book I was telling you about um, dispelled for me. Because we have this story of the origin of tango saying, oh, tango was born in the brothels in the wrong part of town, and then eventually it be became decent and cleaned up, and it triumphed uh, because uh, in Paris they started dancing it in the aristocracy, and then it came back to Argentina, and the aristocracy in Argentina said, the Parisians are doing this savage dance from the wrong side of the tracks, let's learn it. There's a kernel of truth there, but you know what? What, what these res researchers found out was that the tango was really everywhere. The tango was something that you actually heard in the 19th century in the salons or in the family homes of anybody who learned the piano. You start discovering that there's tango in the 19th century and it's not coming out of any house of ill repute. It's coming out of, like I said, the publishers and, uh, and, the, and the people who played the, the piano. And so without going into too many details about that era, it arrives in Argentina and it's played not just in the pianos, but the military bands play it. And also you start having um, little groups that play it, sometimes with a harp, uh, sometimes with a guitar, and eventually with the piano. The piano that was in the homes of perhaps families with, with, with more money starts making it into the, into the places where, where musicians actually play. And yes, once the Parisians discovered this dance that was coming from Argentina and they started dancing it, the need to perform it down in Buenos Aires was, was very big. Um, they, they, they started paying attention to this music that yes, perhaps it was not necessarily from, from the brothels, but it had a certain element. And this is where we have to separate two things about tango to make it more in, it, it, understandable. There's a dance and there's a music. And it literally, ha they have parallel but not the same story, why? Because the dance comes out of the embrace, and it comes out of, of a certain, um, I want to say, a taming or a certain controlling of, of movement that takes away some of this Africanness that we hear in this music, and takes away some of the hip swiveling, and brings it into a frame of an embrace, and it brings it into a walk. And this is a major innovation in the history of dance. You read histories of dance, and they talk about the tango, not as a phenomenon that was curiosity or novelty, but it's something that happened to dance. Because before that, you had the courtly dances where they were in front of each other, or you had the very stiff formal dances where there was you know, very little contact. And here you have a dance that actually moves the couple together and has two elements that were where the scandal comes in, the corte, and the quebrada. The corte is a cut in the movement, is a, a stop in the movement. And when, the, when you stop in the movement, you do figures in place. And that's, that's not necessarily uh, something that you see except in dances where are very choreographed, like a minuet, they may stop and they do, but in, that's that. And they have the quebrada, which is some of this Africanness that comes into the, but as, as you know, many of you I know are dancers, it's a dance that doesn't swivel the way Cousins, we're more stiff, we're more reserved. And that, say historians, is what brought it into polite society. That it is, it, it took away a little bit of this mandinga and things that were coming from the African uh, culture and sort of made it proper. And for the Parisians, it was just the right balance because it was the wildness of the Americas and it was the, enough restraint from them. And it could only happen in Argentina, as Argentines say, because we have that magic mixture of this European immigration, not overwhelmed by the Afro, Afro culture like you have it in, in other places. So we have a different balance between the, the European and, and African cultures. So um, there's one more element that, and this is where I, I'm sharing with you at this point, sort of the fringes of my research, which is the Italian immigration. Because when you start having tangos written in the 1920s and so, and we're gonna get into that, all of a sudden the composers are Tagliatelli, Moradatti, Baldini, and, and you know, and, and there is a character to the music. It starts losing that swivel. So that's, that's how, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's play a tango. I can hear you thinking, play a tango. All right, so. Angel Villoldo was sort of a, a troubadour 
there was this other type of character in Argentina. Imagine Buenos Aires, is a, a city full of theaters and, and poets and composers and uh, visitors from ab abroad. This was a really vibrant city. And this man, uh, Angel Villoldo, uh, told stories, did monologues. Uh, we, we hear a lot of them when, when we started having recordings, made up songs, put dirty words in some other songs. And um, he was not musically literate, but somebody put down some of his music and a lot of it got published. And one of them became one of the most famous songs in the world, El Choclo, otherwise known as Kiss of Fire. You may have heard Louis Armstrong doing that. Or if you're in the Jewish community, Kiss of Meyer by, uh, by Mickey Katz. But this is El Choclo by Angel Vizol. Then we start. the story here. Why? Well, when the dance got uh, established, the music wasn't quite following the dance. The music came, as I said, but they had these roots in Spain, they had these roots in Cuba, I had a little bit of a Brazilian in it, and it comes down to Argentina and it mixes with concert music. Yet, the dance evolved in its own way. It had these stops, and it had these swivels, and it had this walk about it. And it wasn't until the dance was well established towards the end of the 19 teens that a pianist by the name of Roberto Firpo heard a march during a trip to Montevideo across the river from Buenos Aires. And this was a student march written by a young uh, architecture student, Gerardo Matos Rodriguez. And Mr. Firpo, who was a band leader already and who was one of the prominent band leaders in Buenos Aires at the time, 1917 or so, said, that is a tango. That march is a tango. And that piece became the most famous tango in the world. It, the melody, melody, quote. So on. You've heard it before, right? Sure. Now we've gone away for the. Oh my God! You're on. You're on. Sing, sing, sing. <laughs> <laughs> it's your cue. Um, so we're gonna play la comparsita again. We're gonna we're gonna play around with it. But here, the tango finds its rhythm. Is this march? It, it separates it. And this is where I think a lot of the confusion and where my breakthroughs in my own uh, research has been. 
okay, the Abaneda, the Cubans and the Brazilians and the uh, New Orleans and the Spanish and so forth, but that's not what I hear when I go to a tango dance. I hear this music that is more of a march. And many of you who are dancers, imagine the, the Sarlis or the Pulises or the Darienzos, or all the music that you dance from later, from the 30s and 40s. So this is where we, it's good to go chronologically and realize something happened in Argentina where they said, you know this dance that we're doing, the music is more like this. So here comes La Comparsita. <laughs> It's a custom at this point in, in, in time to play the song as the closer for events. So we're all used to hearing this song and packing up. <laughs> She's ready to go. <laughs> but chronologically, that's the way it works. And, and this music so it comes into, into Buenos Aires and into the world, really, um, as the Argentine tango. So now the, the word that has been going around, it's, all, it's very curious because the word tango comes from the Congo language in Africa, and it was all over America and it gets to Argentina, and finally, when it becomes Europeanized, we kind of capture the name, and the tango now means tango argentino. But in, it, back in the day, if you look, there's the tango brasilero, and, and there's the tangana rhythm in, in the Spanish tinge in New Orleans, and, the, and there's the, the, the tango andaluz, and there's the tango in the operettas in the 19th century. But we, as good Argentines we are, we stole it, and we keep it for ourselves as, as our national dance. Um, so we get to this point, and what happened was that, um, you know, the tango becomes very established. It's dance all over the city. It's dance in polite society. A lot of musicians buy their first tuxedo and start working in that milieu. A lot of uh, conservatory trained musicians. There's a lot of Italian immigrants coming in, founding uh, conservatories, the sons and, 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 of, of, of these uh, um, conservatory uh, owners coming from Italy become prominent musicians and then by the 1920s with all this work 
and all these musicians, we have the first golden era of the tango. Um, and that's pretty much where, where we find the music that we just played. Um, the other element in, in, in tango music, remember we had this, this man, Angel Bijolo, who was a, a, a storyteller. There was a tradition of singing tangos. Uh, I'm not going to sing today. <clears throat> I'm not going to sing today, but, um, <laughs> but we're going to play one of these beautiful tangos that become from the, come from the lyrical tradition of tango. And this is where some of the Italian also comes in, because a lot of these tango singers were opera fans, and there was a prominent opera uh, in, in Buenos Aires. And so we have a whole other tradition of tango song. Like I said, you're going to have to hear it in our melodies, not in my voice today. But um, the most important singer of these, and, and so, to some people, the creator of tango singing, how do you sing this music that we've just created down here, is uh, Carlos Gardel. And Carlos Gardel started out as a singer with guitarists and going around and singing all sorts of different kinds of music. And by the 1920s, middle 1920s and, and so on, um, he starts recording almost exclusively tangos. So he went from recording a, a tango in 1917, then another one in 1919, to by the late 20s being the tango singer. And this is uh, something that he, uh, in the 30s, he was making movies um, here, in fact, in, in, in Queens at Paramount. And, um, and they started composing these songs that were already outside of the kind of tango that we just heard. Uh, they were more lyrical. They were also meant for international consumption. Some of the language subtleties that we had in our tango got washed out. And, but he became extremely popular, very famous, toured all over Latin America until he died in a plane accident in 1935. So here is Volver by Carlos Cardé.
Tango at that point had peaked uh, towards the early 20s. Um, Argentina was really uh, one of the richest countries in the world. We had a future. Um, and they say that at one point uh, in the 19 teens, it was not really clear if the next superpower would be Argentina or the United States. Now you know the answer to that one. Um, and what happened was that after all this opulence in the 20s, when the crash in the 1930s, we also had the beginning of the sort of unraveling of our wonderful society. Um, we had the first military coup, where the military went in the street and said, actually, the power is us, and the president is this guy over here. And so they subverted democracy, and it's, as you know, if you know some of Argentine history, that was just the beginning of many times where elected governments were deposed. Of course, the elected government they deposed was populist and had started to deal with some of the disparity that there is in Argentina between landowners and, and capitalists and, and, and the rest of the population. They had the military to resolve that. So there was a wide cynicism in the early 30s in Argentina. There was the economic depression. We couldn't export to the north because everybody had the economic trouble over here. Um, and, the, and the tango had become slower and more nostalgic and more backward looking. Uh, and it, it was, you know, and also it was under threat from at the American entertainment industry. Hollywood and the radio was starting in the, in the mid-30s. And there was a man who had been playing the tango throughout the 20s, who somehow, and this is a very interesting thing, and I haven't been able to, you know, there's no documentation for a lot of these things, but it is very clear that he made the conscious decision of doing something to tango to revive it, to have it, to, for it to have the, 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 the spirit at, that needed to to compete with all these different dances and music things coming. And the, and the, and the one thing that he did, um, he didn't really write new music, he went to the old tangos, the tangos that had been written in the first era of tango, and he said, yes, but it's faster, and it's staccato, and it's, it's more exciting. And his name was Juan D'Arienzo, and he literally left his violin, stood in front of the orchestra and started conducting, and starting in a, around 1935, so really clearly after the, the whole crisis of the 30s, he said, you know, this is, this is how tango is done. And he was enormously popular and created the dance that now, yes, this is what you will find if you walk into any dance hall anywhere around the world. They start the, the dancing, the, the DJs start with this music from 1935 onwards. So it really was yet another transformation that, of course, took it even further away from the old pop, 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 pop and more into something that really D'Arienzo and all these Biaggis and all these Italians really brought their nerve into it. So we're going to play a tango that was old, from also from the 19-teens, but we're going to play it in the style of Juan D'Arienzo, Felicia. And this is what happened. All oh, from what you just heard, he went, what? so simple 
and, and, and straightforward. It attracted a lot of dancers uh, who had not <laughs> stepped into the, in the dance halls and the, uh, the, the tango houses of the 1920s. Um, it became more of a middle class, let's go out dancing on the weekend um, kind of thing. It really uh, transformed itself. Uh, it was played on the radio. The orchestras had grown because, you know, back then they didn't have all this uh, amplification equipment. So instead of being quartets and quintets and sextets, they were large orchestras, 12 musicians, 14 musicians, and so, so on. And they played in all the social clubs around the neighborhoods of Buenos Aires, in the provinces, in other cities. It really became... Um, a, a, a very different phenomenon, very more of a middle class phenomenon, and um, and from this, a lot of orchestras picked up this style. They literally sped up their music. If you study the recordings and you start listening chronologically, what happened to these people? Some people who had been playing nice and slow tango in the twenties, you find them playing, and you know, being a musician, we know what it is. If you don't do this, you don't eat, you don't work. <laughs> no, we want one of these fast orchestras. You know, we want we want them. Straightforward. So a lot of uh, temperamentally uh, artists that you can hear before and after, you can hear them doing slower and more stretched out stuff. There's a period in there, it's quite curious, in 1939-40, where everybody's just like, well, this is the beat, you know, for this year, the beat of the year. Um, now, one thing I want to bring, bring back at this point, um, because it did come back more or less at this point, is our old friend. Our old friend had found another rhythm in Argentina called the milonga, and they had married together. Uh, this was, in a way, the local version of this tango rhythm that was going on around. Um, and I hadn't mentioned it earlier because there's so many different ingredients. Um, but but the, 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 the milonga ingredient comes not just from the gaucho, as we usually say. You know, it's, it's, it's a poetic form. Uh, lo desparejo y no voy por la vereda that, that sort of thing and, and they used to do verbal fights with two different gauchos uh, uh, <laughs> making up these these uh, these uh, words and stuff like almost like uh, rap battles um, that music had fused with it with this afro argentine rhythm they formed the tango and then it disappeared just like the, just like this rhythm we haven't played that rhythm in, in the last 10 or 15 minutes of this presentation. It kind of, once we hit the march and once it speeds up, there's a, another group of, co uh, of musicians, uh, prominently Sebastián Piana, but there's, there's other musicians who said, oh, remember the milonga, now that we're going back and sort of redoing some of these old tangos and we found, let's bring back the milonga. And one of the first milongas that were written in the time, now they, they don't go back and recapture old, like they did with the tangos where they had the sheet music and they said, let's play the old tangos. They said, let's write some new milongas. Let's do a milonga sentimental at the temple more or less that they used to do it back then. Which... of the temple, we get this milonga a little later, like maybe 10 or 15 years later, we're here. Milonga de mis amores.
<laughs> Thank you. So, we have the golden era of the tango starting in 1935, 39s, I would say, well into the 40s. Um, and what's curious to me, you know, I've been living here in the States. I'm originally from Argentina, but I've been living here 36 years or so. Um, is that this part of our story was not that well known. At least when I moved here in the 80s, um, tango was still the 1920s sound, Valentino, the, the, the rose on your teeth. I don't know what they do. That. That hurts. I don't know why they do that. that hurts. They think we do that. We don't do that. We eat. We eat. We eat. That's why we bleed. <laughs> um, so that stereotype was still around. And in the 1980s, there was a review, a show called Tango Argentino. How many of you saw Tango Argentino? Right? Some of you have been tango crazy ever since, right? <laughs> Change your lives. I remember that when they came. What that brought was that golden era into the consciousness of, of, of the American public. Because in the 40s and 50s, you guys were busy. You were fighting wars, and you had swing, and there were a lot of things that were going on culturally that this thing going on in Argentina, tango had already been, oh yeah, tango, that, that's, that's that stuff from the 1920s, you know, the, the, the really rigid stuff. So we had, and so when, when tango Argentino came into the States in the 80s, by my theory at least, is that that's when you caught up with everything. So, oh, of course for Latinos, for us, Colombians or even Puerto Ricans or Cubans or Mexicans, you know, they know our music. We, that music really had transcended, and obviously with singers, with lyrics in Spanish and so forth. It was a very well-known genre. But even the dance had transformed itself to this middle class, much easier to pick up dance. And that had been lost because everybody just sort of had this image of the, of the tuxedo and the 1920s stiffness. So, so it was a big shock and something, you know, for me having emigrated from Argentina, it's something that I found of all places in Los Angeles. And, uh, and has been with me you know, all, the, all these years um, to really identify in this music and move it forward. Um, and and uh, let's continue a little bit with our story because what happened after this acceleration of the tempo, this, this transformation in the music that allowed the music to compete with jazz, swing, rumba, uh, the tropical music as they call it back, the Brazilian samba and so forth, was this quickening of the rhythm. But eventually some of these artists started finding their own voice and started finding uh, uh, different ways to bring back some of the stops and starts that the tango has. After all, tango started as a dance that one of the key elements was the stopping and the turning. Remember the corte and the quebrada. So by the 1950s we have Quite a different beast. People are still dancing, but the, it's almost like that certain parts of the repertoire, parts some of the orchestras started to mold back again into the slowness and the, and the more intricate uh, interaction in, of the dancers. Um, we're going to play a piece from the, from the 1950s called Danzarin by the composer Julian Plaza to show you how much the tango stretched in those decades. <laughs>
So, we have to talk about one man. Just one person who really, after all this careful construction of a style of tango and of a tradition, one musician turned the whole thing on its head. It's really remarkable. Astor Piazzolla. Astor Piazzolla was born in the 20s, when the tango was aristocratic and, and stiff, but not in Buenos Aires. He was born in the beach town of Mar del Plata, about 400 kilometers south of Buenos Aires. And um, when the 1930s crisis hit, his family packed up and moved to New York. And he lived in Little Italy and became a street urchin and, uh, and really, uh, you know, a different character uh, than what he had back in Argentina. And one of the things that his dad did to him or for him uh, at the time is he got him a bandoneon and he started learning uh, not just tango but also classical music on this quintessential uh, tango instrument. Um, and Piazzolla went back to, to, to Argentina with his family, returned to New York because things were still not uh, happening, and in the, in the late 30s moved back to Mar del Plata, to this beach resort. By then, Piazzolla was 17. He was a uh, musician, he was playing, he had been a child prodigy, he had been around. In fact, when, when the great Carlos Gardel was filming on Paramount Studios, um, the, the Paramount uh, uh, movies at the uh, uh, Astoria Studios, um, Piazzolla was invited to be in one of those movies as a, as a little kid selling newspapers. So this is, this is someone who really has a very special biography, um, who studied very hard and who went, returned to Argentina from New York and immediately um, was taken to Buenos Aires where all the great orchestras were. Now we're talking about the golden age, we're talking about 1939. So when, when tango was revived, when this fast tempo, when everybody was dancing, he goes to Buenos Aires and starts um, attending the, the, the performances of one of his favorite orchestras, the Aníbal Troilo Orchestra, and just sitting there in the cafe until one day one of the bandoneon players in the orchestra didn't show up. And he had been around enough that one of the musicians said, you know, that kid over there, he can play. And so he took an audition and got the job. And in a way, the rest is history because he was an odd guy who played Gershwin for his audition and Bach. And, uh, and uh, you know, he was, he was a very consummate musician. He was a professional. He could read, he could write. So he started writing and studying. In fact, he came up, uh, uh, he tells the story of how he came um, in, in, in opposition to a lot of the uh, uh, working musicians at the time. Uh, at the time, if you played more or less decently, there were so many orchestras and there was so much work that you could play. He, on the other hand, was studying classical music, writing, and so he says he kept trying to push the boundaries of this until he, he broke, basically, with the tango and started infusing some of the music that he was learning, in, in classical circles particularly, into traditional tango. Um, he quit tango for a while, he wrote for movies, he continued to study. He won a prize to study in France. We're talking now about the early 50s. He went to France, studied with the same professor at, that, that taught um, uh, Philip Glass and Aaron Copeland, the, the, the uh, esteemed uh, Nadia Boulanger. Returns to Argentina. His attitude now is you know, off, off the charts. He really thinks that he is going to revolutionize this music and bring this music to the next level, as indeed he did, so he was convinced of something that he was able to deliver, um, and starts writing first, starts writing music that was way too challenging. And so in, in, the, in, the, in the second part of the 50s, he, he, he basically, he writes himself out of the, of the tango scene and of the working scene by, by really applying some of this stuff that he was learning in, in his studies. Um, when, when it becomes unbearable, he moves to New York again. By now he's in, practically in his 40s, he has two kids, he's living on 92nd Street, and, um, and he's trying to, to uh, write for, for film, and he eventually, he wants to write in Hollywood, he didn't realize Hollywood is way on the other coast, he's here in New York, <laughs> he knows New York, he, uh, he uh, starts writing for some of the great um, band leaders like Machito, and in the Latin scene, and there's some singers he writes for, he at one point in, in the, in the um, this desire of, of making a living, surviving, he has the kids at home. He writes an album that was purely commercial. He calls that Take Me Dancing. Um, and it's an album where he tries to invent a rhythm called uh, the JT, Jazz Tango, JT. Um, that album is a total failure. 
um, he has to pack up basically and go back to Argentina. Now, to give you a sense of by then how important he was, he goes to Argentina, he starts recording for RCA Victor, and he records a, a film and two albums on the first uh, year when he came back. So he really was a very prominent musician. And then that's when his music starts, a little bit with the New York experience and trying to absorb some of these Latin rhythms, hearing uh, uh, West Coast jazz, uh, hearing uh, the beginning of the bossa nova, um, the, the early 60s, late 50s, but particularly the early 60s, and here in New York as well, uh, you start hearing the, the, the bossa nova with its you know, stripped down uh, rhythms. They, 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 they strip down the samba and all the stuff that there was all drums, they bring it down to the guitar and it mellows and there's a sound in there and he finds his own sound. He stops trying to impress everybody with these European techniques of comp composition and he finds the soul of his music. One of the things that he, he brings into um, our music is the old milonga. Now, the way he brings it into the repertoire is he goes back to that old milonga that was used for reciting poetry that I made a fool of myself singing about a few minutes ago. Um, what, John? <laughs> um, and, and he brings that lyrical aspect and that slow milonga, deadly slow, beautiful. Um, and so we're going to play one of these milongas, Oblivion. <laughs> Piazzolla, um, nowadays, no tango composer can avoid his language. It's really, um, it's almost an effort you have to do when you write tango, when you think of yourself as a creative uh, musician in the tango tradition, to realize that he is a single force in this music, and, and you need to sort of go back and study the rest of the music where he comes from to, uh, to extricate yourself. But I, I hear a lot of people who, who write beautiful milongas like this. In fact, uh, Emilio has one on, on, on our album. Uh, it's just, he's really established this form of slow milonga, the, the uh, some people call it the countryside milonga, the, the milonga of the gaucho, not the one that, that was danced. 
Um, and one of the things that he did to the rhythm, um, you may have noticed, he, he um, we're back to this pattern that we've been talking about the whole he, uh, time. He, he pulses it at twice the pulse. So instead of, he does. starts agitating it more. He was after some sound that had to do with jazz. He really, he admired jazz a lot, and he realized that what had happened to Brazilian music and the bossa nova was that jazz came in, and some of the simplicity of West Coast jazz and third stream jazz and the modern jazz quartet and Stan Getz and so forth was getting to them, and they were trying to make a music that was a lot more concise. Um, we're going to close with another one of, of um, Piazzolla's um, compositions where he uh, brings together some of this milonga rhythm into a much more exciting, this, this is something he wrote in the 1970s. Um, I want to make a couple of announcements. We do have a, an album coming out. Emilio Soja has written an album of, of, of uh, arrangements and original compositions. And in a way, um, the 10 tracks in there have uh, different aspects of what we've been talking about today, um, different periods. Um, it concludes, in fact, with a tango that I did uh, using samples and drum machines and all that, that good stuff that nowadays we make music with at home in our computers. Um, and I chopped up some of the stuff from the recording and made my own piece. And it starts at the very beginning with the first piece that we played to you from 1897 and everything in between, um, Piazzolla and so forth. So um, we have some flyers and I, I gave some flyers out. We're very proud of this also because this marks the beginning of my own record label. Um, I've gone, I've gone crazy, mm -hmm. and decided in the middle of this whole turmoil of the. Uh, thank you. Don't encourage me now. Uh, <laughs> uh, the idea is that I've been, I've been in this tangle world in, 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 in this country for 35 years. Um, I, I also feel like, in a way, we have um, come to a point where there's so much dancing, and a lot of the dancing is happening with the old recordings from the 1930s and 40s. And where, where are we? And so one of the dilemmas we have as musicians is that we are competing against these wonderful recordings that are uh, perfect. And that this, these 12 to 14 musicians who played every day and who were getting paid very well, you know, and who made a living and, 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 and rehearsed and played and all that beautiful stuff, played every day, that, that to the music. Anyway, we're going against that, and there's three of us, and we're coming in, and, you know. So for many years, that's been sort of a, a, an obsession of mine. It's like, what, what's our contribution here? And I think that we've come to the point where we really, in, in, in my life at least, and, and, uh, and the music industry has, as you know, fallen apart. But on the other hand, there's many ways to reach you. It's not just the CDs. Uh, uh, you know, you may buy a CD today, but when you go back online, we're there. Well, we're almost to be there. We're just yeah. launching this. We're just mm -hmm. announcing that, in fact, this weekend. You're the, some of the first people to hear it. Um, but we'll be there. We'll be in your Spotify's and your YouTube's and, and all of that. We'll also sell our recordings. And so if you like tango music, uh, support us by buying our recordings. It's as simple as that. We have a place where you can buy it. In fact, we have a place where you can pay what you want. You can overpay. And we won't <laughs> give you the money back. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's called Avant Tango Records. The website is avantango.com. We, we finally, we have it ready this weekend to actually make these announcements and not make full of ourselves with uh, anything to deliver. The album is there in 30 second excerpts. The CD will come out December 1st. Uh, you can pre-order. So if you're motivated and you still love us when you get home, um, you, you can actually order it and we'll, we'll ship it to you. Um, and the last plug I'll do is I have an album with me, my own album. Um, that. Piazzolla commercial record that he made in the 50s that I was telling you about, the Take Me Dancing, was another obsession of mine. I've been trying to combine jazz and tango for as long as I've been playing tango, because um, it's sort of what made me a musician was, you know, uh, John Coltrane and Charles Mingus and some of the great music. That's what really uh, inspired me to become a musician. And so I've, that's the other part that I've been trying to pull them together. Um, and one of my, my projects, when there was the anniversary of, of, of Piazzolla's death a, a few years ago, and everybody was making Piazzolla projects, I said, you know that forgotten and reviled recording he made in New York to see if he could have a commercial hit to feed his kids? I can relate to all of the above. <laughs> and so I made an album called Piazzolla in Brooklyn, 
where I, I, I took down the music from the recording, I went down to Buenos Aires, and I have my crew over there that I record with, including on drums, Piazzolla's grandson. So this recording that Piazzolla had made had uh, maracas and bongos and a lot of stuff that he had compromised because he was in New York and trying to make a Latin dance record. Instead of the maracas and bongos, I have his grandson on drums, P.P. Piazzolla. And, uh, and we literally re recreated his, not just his compositions, but he was doing Laura and uh, uh, he does Lullaby and Birdland and some of the standards from the, from the jazz songbook. So I have a few copies of that as well. And um, as, at a special price, of course, discount price today, 10 bucks. Um, um, thank you so much um, for being with us. We're going to close with Astro Piazzolla's hit, Liber Tango.